so we've been going through Genesis for the last number of weeks. And who's the patriarch at this time that we're focused on? Esau. Last week was Esau. So Jacob's the one we're focused on right now. He's gone from being a man of the field, deceiving his father, living with Laban, his uncle, married, children, and now he's back in Canaan. Uh, so at chapter 35, just a couple of chapters back when we left him, went to Esau and came back, uh, where did Jacob relocate to? What, what area is he currently in? Yeah, so in 16, in chapter 35, verse 16, he traveled to Bethel. And at the very end of 35, uh, we find them in memory where Isaac was, and they buried Isaac. So he is the oldest living patriarch as he received the birthright, received the blessing. Um, while Jacob was in uh, living with Laban, where did Esau move to? Got that just real briefly at the very beginning of 36. Down to Edom. So he moves down that Mount of Seir, which becomes a landmark, as we'll see as we keep going through 35, and especially... Uh, or excuse me, not 35, as we keep going through Genesis, and as if you read through Exodus and those, that continues to be a landmark for the Israelites as they're traveling. And then, so we leave Esau. When we leave Esau in 36, we do discuss that he is still alive at this point, but that's the last time that we read of him being alive in the text that we're going through. So his lineage is kind of covered. Uh, they go through, kind of close him out. So from a standpoint, we still, we still hear about him. He still gets referenced back to but it's really kind of the last interaction we have with him and the way that uh, Moses represents Jacob as being alive at this time. Yeah, so he changes it from Esau to Edom. Yeah, not so. Jacob is Israel. Uh, that's going to be an interesting point here because even though we've seen two different separate occasions where God has told him your name has changed that we've covered, we're still seeing Jacob get referenced a lot more than we do Israel. Well, one of the only references of Israel so far was the land reference. We actually will actually go through and um, get him called Israel twice in this read today, but it goes back and forth. He's called Jacob far more often right now than he is Israel. So the name change hasn't, I guess, officially taken place at this time, or they haven't officially recognized that name change in the way that the Moses wrote wrote it at this time. So we're going to start here with Jacob, if my tablet will stay where I want it to. Uh, let's go ahead and start with chapter 37. Uh, we'll start going with 1 through 4. Chapter 37, 1 through 4. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him could not speak peaceably unto him. So to start off with here, I think it's to me it's interesting. So he's feeding the flock with the sons of Billa and the sons of Zilpha. How, how many children do you all remember that being? How many did each of them have? It was four in total. So uh, Billa had Dan and Naphtali, Zilpha had Asher and Gad. So he's got six kids at this point. We know Joseph's about 17. Uh, Rachel died not long ago, so Benjamin's really too young to be working in the field at this point. Uh, notes here that uh, Chris provided say he's about one maybe at this time, so he's too young. So he's got 11 kids, only half of them, five of them are, or 11 working age, and five of them are in the field, but I don't know where the other six are. I mean, we know he's got plenty of herds and stuff, but it's interesting where the older ones are, because especially because, uh, uh, Reuben through, I think it's Judah, are the four oldest, and they're not recorded here being in the field, so some of the younger ones that are in the field at this time. 
Uh, we do see here that even though in verse 1 he's referred to as Jacob, he does get a reference, I think it's in verse 3, uh, as Israel. I couldn't find any significant reason for going back and forth between the names. But it's just kind of interesting that even though his name's changed, we haven't really seen that hard and fast, no longer Jacob, now Israel scenario. One thing that was put in here, uh, the coat, and I'm going to butcher it if I try to go through the name, uh, but it, the translation of many colors, uh, uh, from what I kind of was able to find about it and what was provided here, uh, doesn't actually reference a coat that's really colorful or has a lot of colors to it. It's a coat of a nobleman. I guess it was unusual, but it reached the wrists and the ankles. So it was, a, I guess it was more elaborate, very ornate uh, design. Uh, so I, I know you get there and you start reading about Lydia, the seller of purple, and you get some of those items of color was kind of an unusual thing at the time. So it was kind of a, a, a rarity to get into. It was expensive. I know the purple was expensive at the time. But it, it's a coat. If it's a coat of a nobleman, it's kind of one of the definitions of it. I can see where that would brought even more contention to the gift. Because it's not just that you provided him with something nicer than anybody else, but you provided him with something of status. It's something that raised him up in the uh, eyes of his brothers to a position, you know, potentially above them because he's wearing nicer clothes than they are. Uh, but once again, we see where the favoritism that Rebecca and Isaac played carries on to the next generation. And you have to know these sons are aware of it. You have to know that the, the moms, the mothers had to have some conversations about it because you know the contention between Leah and Rachel and you go back to Reuben's mandrakes. But they knew that infighting was there, so it's nothing unusual. So there, I can see where there's a lot of contention around this action. Well, that's the verse two, because he basically found on the brothers. Mm -hmm. so that's not going to be any difference. It's a good point, because <laughs> the yeah, the on the tablet I've got it's got the, the Bible that I've downloaded has the ability you can tap on and get the words that not, that report is actually synonymous with slander so it's almost a whispering something he's done behind his brother's back they're aware of it but it's not so much of they're not doing right we need to get this straight it's hey do you know what they're doing scenario it's a little sister telling on her brother for everything he does not to have experience there <laughs> Well, I won't start the fact she usually is the one that starts it either. So let's see. <laughs> uh, I will say at this point, my best guess is Reuben has to be somewhere around 30 at this point. It doesn't ever say it, but he's the oldest. Joseph's 10 kids behind him. We know Joseph's 17. So even if they were one right after another uh, birthed, I mean, they could be closer, but. Uh, I'm guessing he's got to be at least 30 at this point, just from the chronological of the, uh, the way the generations were built. Not that they couldn't be closer than that, but it's just kind of a, a guess at that point. So uh, it'll kind of play as we go through here, being somebody who's a little bit older, hopefully a little bit more mature, <coughs> but still going through this. Um, so, I mean, and you also think about what happened with uh, Dinah back in chapter 35. What did the, I think it was Simeon and Judah, I got my, in my notes, I may be a little further down if I bring this up. What did they do to the town of Shechem? Yeah, they slaughtered the town. They took the people, the women and children as slaves. If they're willing to go through and do that, what other items are they probably not gonna have much of a problem doing? So I imagine the reports he came back with, uh, were, there's probably not real pretty in a lot of cases. So uh, the, keep in mind the, the hatred, because it just keeps building as we go through this, and I think it plays a lot into as we're going through it. Anybody have anything that would like to add to this section? Let's uh, read five through eight, please. Joseph dreamed the dream, and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. 
and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So one thing that kind of struck me is kind of get later on in the Proverbs, which obviously were written quite a bit of time after this. You get like Proverbs 17, 24, wisdom is before him that have understanding, that is a fool or ends in the world of the earth. And also so verse 20, a little further down, even a fool and holding his peace is kind of wise. He that showed his lips esteemed a man of understanding. Seems like when you have these kind of dreams and you've, he's got to understand the way his brothers feel about him. Maybe not having shared this would have been the smarter move. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so, I understand you want to tell somebody, but this may not have been the smartest thing you could have said. Hmm. Uh, we do know J Jacob's, or excuse me, Joseph's, I'm going to probably do that a dozen times during the day if I were guessing. Joseph's dreams were divinely inspired. We do know as he goes through and he helps out with Potiphar. As he sees, we've seen with Potiphar and the blessings he has there, the dreams in life in prison, of others he understands, the dreams of Pharaoh that we get into in the next couple chapters. So we know that this is something, that a gift from God that, has, that these dreams are coming from. So if they're divinely inspired, the brothers at this point have to understand that the actions as this happened, Jacob's going where he's going, they've had to hear the story of the dream in Bethel, the Jacob, what we've referred to now as Jacob's Ladder. The success that he had in Laban's crops, or Laban's crops of the cattle, he was able to grow his herds, where he's been moving to, why they're going these places. Um, he even goes to Rachel and Leah when they leave Laban, saying, God's told me to go back, you'll have a reason to stay. They knew that was God's direction. So God's directed them Jacob has been through dreams, through the great conversation. And now Joseph has having those dreams next. Um, you kind of got two reactions you can have. Okay, he's going to be the next leader from the perspective God's chosen him to receive these. Or, oh great, our youngest brother is going to be leading us. And that's more of the reaction that we see here. Um, but, I mean, every chapter is pretty much since 31 when... Uh, even probably before then, but 31, we do know that uh, the dream is what brought Jacob back from Laban's. In 31, 11 through 16, um, his name's changed. He came back crippled from an interaction with God because uh, of his hip being taken out of spot and, or out of joint in 32, uh, 24 through 32. So they have to know that, these, that God is directly involved in everything that they're doing. Um, so they've got to understand that some of this is divine divinely inspired. I'm not sure that's the first reaction you'd have at this case, considering he's the youngest of the brothers, but you have to understand that, that uh, there is other stuff going on here. But regardless of all that, go ahead. No, I was just going to tell you that the, but when we see God's plan laid out, you know, pushing the button on the older brothers, well, you, it might be up to a point where they will throw you in the hole. Right. Know? And um, so, it for us, the challenge is to kind of, kind of what you're saying there is, is to see the message of God's will and don't get up or tied up in the maybe it's a brother and their admonishment or sister's admonishment. And we get we get caught up in the who are you to tell me versus or even the way it's said. Right. Don't get caught up in that. Listen to the message first. <laughs> if it's if it's true and, and good, well, thank you, my good order, no matter the delivery method, mode, or whatever you want to say. Right. And so, but for him, uh, in his youth and having these, these started up pretty, pretty good with brother, but they're, they're not they're not seeing past that it's God's will. He, they can't even pass their little brother and cause a problem. And there you don't like him, so that's not going to help anything right. in the message regardless. Yeah. Because one thing is, to that exact point, is when we see him address the butcher and the baker later on in prison, we see him address Pharaoh, there's a difference in the message. There's a difference in the presentation. There's, I have to say, there's some wisdom being learned here, even though it's the hard way, but there is wisdom in what he's, how he's presenting the information. Yeah, it's not hard to see from strictly a worldly view how he winds up in the position he winds up in. 
9 through 11, please. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I, your mother, and your brothers of thee come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Thank you. Um, so just keep in mind here that his mother is uh, has passed, though. She passed in uh, Benjamin a couple chapters back when uh, she was given birth. But we still have the other mother, so it's the family unit, I think, was being referred to here. And I know even when you're little in the back classrooms there, you talk about the sons, Jacob, the moons, the mom, brothers of the stars. You, know, you get the it's pretty easy um, references there. Go ahead. Where did the stars so he's the eleventh brother, and Benjamin's behind him for the thing number eleven. But I do love Jacob's reaction here. For, um, Shall I, thy mother, brethren, indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Jacob is in his position because he supplanted Esau's birthright and blessing. So for someone who has deceitfully gained their position to then rebuke somebody else for claiming that they're going to be the next one in line, it's, it's kind of an interesting reaction. Doesn't like the fact that now he's going to be bowing down to one of his sons when he's had no problem lying to his father to get the uh, two-thirds blessing, I guess is how you would say it on. So it's funny whenever, and I know we talked about this on some of the others with Jacob's dealing with Laban. Laban was dealing with him deceitfully and got upset about it. Well, you dealt deceitfully with your family. It's hard not to imagine that people can deal deceitfully with you. The difference here is a little bit Jacob's pretty forthcoming with it. This is the, or excuse me, Joseph. He's pretty forthcoming with it. He said, this is a dream I've had. And Jacob gets upset about it. So it's always fun for someone who's lived that life to get upset because somebody else is saying, I'm going to take over at some point. It kind of seems like Jacob would, and I, it may be what that means, was this Jacob kept these matters in mind, because Jacob had already had demons with God and the dreams and visions. So when Joseph says this, it seems like he would have thought, okay, this will happen, you know. And I kind of think at the end of that verse is kind of what that means. Now, he did rebuke him at first, but... When he says he kept the matters in mind, I think he was probably kind of thinking of those past instances. It's probably the initial RAS reaction, and then like, wait a minute, this isn't that this, unusual for my yeah, personal I've been experience. Through this before, you know, and these things didn't happen. Yeah, you could just be asking for clarification. So you're, this is what you're saying, and you know, we're all going to bow down. Where everybody else gets mad, he, you know, speaks in his heart or observes the same. He didn't doubt. I mean, another way to look at that, he kept in mind what he said, and then just because, again, like what she's saying, he himself has had those visions. So he's not saying it's not true, or I'm not ever going to do that. Right. Yeah. He's, he's, so I, I get because of the statement that he rebuked him, said unto him, yeah. that it was kind of a how dare you kind of say this scenario? But I think to your point is he came back and thought about it and he said, you know, it's that rash, immediate, upset reaction followed by, well, wait a minute, that's not a normal for our family to have this situation occur. Yeah, because it doesn't, just the way it all, the way it says it all, that there's two. I agree, you can kind of look at it. There's two views there, and they don't all go together because it's, he said it that way and fully meant it all the way through. So as far as observing it, keeping it, I don't know. Yeah. But it does leave him in an interesting position sitting here. You, since you know the way that the heritage or the patriarchal has passed, you start with 
God talking to Abraham. You got God talking to Isaac. Now you got God talking to Jacob. We don't read as much of uh, God talking to Esau, so it's, he's only communicating with that patriarchy. So now he's go back and think about it. Well, maybe God's already picked the next leader of out of those twelve sons. And there's a statement that gets made here in a few minutes because of the uh, situation with trying to kill it, with killing uh, Joseph and then selling him, that it's almost as if Simeon has kind of taken over that older uh, brother's role due to Reuben's relationship with one of his, one of Jacob's wives, I can't remember which one specifically. It almost seems like that uh, the leadership has kind of passed by Reuben onto the next brother. And that's an assumption made from man, not necessarily a biblical one, but just a thought. Uh, but if that's the case, you already see where it doesn't always have to follow that firstborn situation. So I run 12 through 17, please. And as Reuben went to be their father in that block, and Israel said it. And Joseph, do not thy brother please the flock. And Shechem, come and I will send thee to them. And he said to him, Here I am. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brother and well with the flock. And bring me word of thee. So he sent him out out of the bells and cover and hid. He came to Shechem. A certain man found him. Behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man said, Ask him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I think my brother, tell me, I pray thee, whether they be the flock, whether they be the flock. And he said, They are departed hence, and I heard them say, Let us go to Rotha. And Joseph went after his brother and found him in Rotha. Thank you. So this is the second, uh, in verse 13, just kind of cover this real quick. Second time in the chapter, and really the last time in the chapter, that Jacob is referred to as Israel. So it's still kind of doing the flip-flop, and we don't really have a hard and fast uh, line in the sand of where his name becomes Israel in the text. So anybody have any hesitation to why he would send his children to Shechem and why if there would be a hesitation to that fact someone kind of talked about a few minutes ago if you kind of breeze through 33 verse 18 um, Jacob bought uh, some actual property in Shechem uh, and actually bought it from uh, Hamor and an individual named Shechem which was the site of what how Chris referred to the greatest sales pitch in history. Uh, and in going to Trent Genesis 34, this is the area that Simeon and Levi slaughtered the Shechemites. It's kind of the heading I've got. I don't know if it's ever referred to in the Bible. So if you go through, I, know, I guess the way that Israel winds up conquering the land, you, you, conquer the people, the land becomes yours. They were there, now it's yours. So I guess from that perspective, you could say that at this point, Jacob owns that area from just a conquest standpoint. He doesn't have some piece of property where they settled, he actually paid for. But he sends his children to go feed a flock in a land that he called that they had an action of what he called to and referred to as making him stink to the people around him. But now he's feeding his flock in the very area that they just slaughtered an entire town. So he was concerned at one point about everybody rising up against him, killing him because of the action his sons took. And now it's kind of like he's trampling over that area of feeding, his, uh, feeding the flock. So kind of an interesting choice to send them back to that location for that purpose. Uh, so I look for it. I don't know if there's any kind of importance of why they moved from Dothan to Shekel. I don't know if they, over, if they just got to the point that they had to move because of the grazing, just had to get to the next location. Uh, one of the notes said that uh, Dothan, it's about a 24 mile trek. And you think about moving herds, for us that's no big deal these days. Just get the car and go in about 20 minutes later, you're there. You know, you're moving herds, you're, a lot of people are probably walking. You know, we don't get a lot about 
riding domesticated animals. We do know there were some camels and stuff they used for pack animals, but you don't get a lot about. So it's it's a it's a move to get that much from one location to the other. So it had to be a pretty conscious thought process. So first read, you can take it as the children weren't listening to their father because he said go to Shechem. That's where they were expected to be and they weren't. Or they went to Shechem, the land wasn't there, so they continued to do their duties and went to the next location. It seems like Jacob is always sending Joseph to Shechem yeah because you kind of get that report from earlier it doesn't say specifically right but it says he brought a bad report back to his father so and now he it says he specifically sent him out there it was like he's using him to always go check on his brothers and considering what we just talked about i'm not sure that's the smartest yeah. option <laughs> to go through that's you know, you're already bringing me bad reports. They already don't like you. Hey, go find out what they're doing and let me know what they're doing. Yeah, that's going to go over well in a family setting like this. Um, one thing I did find interesting here is how much time Joseph spends in the field. And if he stays, if, Joseph, if Jacob keeps him home more, because he's wandering in the fields looking for his brothers. Um, I know when we read the these herds, the number of animals that Jacob sent to Esau, he's got a large amount of animals. It doesn't seem like it'd be that hard of a trail to follow for someone who spends a lot of time watering them, feeding them, keeping track of them, and moving them. I don't know if I'm overreading into that or if that's the intent of the term wandering. It's just when you're wandering, you don't really have a, a location to go to. You don't really know where you're heading towards, you're just kind of moving around looking for something. And until this individual finds him and says, oh, they're that way, I don't know how long he would have been wandering for. So to your point, it sounds like maybe he just goes out there, finds out what they're doing, finds out everything's okay, and then comes back. And then he's just making those treks back and forth. Uh, right. It's a slow progression as they go. They have, they've got to keep that moving, that direction moving. You make a good point there. Uh, and that was something I'd read for someone else is, you know, if he had been a hunter or someone who had been in that occupation, the tracking shouldn't have been that difficult. But it seemed like he's having a hard time following it. It could have, could have been, uh, he's, he sent Joseph maybe time elapsed and then he should have been back. He should have been back by then. So he should send them out to find them. Yeah, they went the wrong direction, the yeah. northern way. That's good. It could be that they were supposed to make that trek and come back around. There may have been normal paths that they were supposed to be following. So let the grass have a chance to come back from being eaten down. One other thing I wanted to cover in here was the phrase, here am I. That was the phrase that uh, Jake, or Joseph answered Jacob when Jacob called him. Here am I. Uh, probably there's one I'm thinking of because it's actually based off the song that we sing. It was probably the most common time we've heard that, do you all think? That, that, that phrase, here am I. Anything come to mind specific? Yes, that's what I want. It goes back to kind of the one I think I think this is the one the song in the work the song book is based off of is back to Isaiah uh, six eight where Isaiah's enthroned facing God and he's looking for people to go out and I, that's Isaiah's response to God here am I the action in the so I kind of looked just did a search on it it's primarily in the Old Testament there's one uh, I think it stops in Isaiah is actually the last time you read it in the Old Testament. Uh, Samuel to Eli is one of them. When, you know, Samuel's dead asleep, hears a name, goes running into Eli, wakes him up. Here am I. What can I do? Uh, the first time I actually was able to find it was Abraham was taking Isaac to sacrifice him. Isaac asked father, and his father goes, here am I. Uh, right as Abraham's bringing him down the knife, the angel stops him. He gets called. His response to the angel's, here am I. 
Isaac, when calls in Esau to go hunting right before the birthright uh, blessing, uh, supplant, supplanting that Jacob did, Esau's response to Isaac is, here am I. Uh, Israel's, uh, I have the wrong up here. Uh, Jacob, I can't talk, excuse me. Jacob's reply to God when he sends him to go down to Egypt in a couple chapters from now in 46, God calls Jacob. Jacob's response to God is, here am I. Uh, Moses in the burning bush in uh, Exodus 3, verse 4, is, here am I. This phrase from what I'm looking at, and I didn't want to go past it without it, to me is a sign of respect to the person that it's being said to. It's a, it's a sign of looking at them, respecting them, showing them what it is. It's not, it seems like something, it kind of shows to me Joseph's character in relation to Jacob. Joseph, or Jacob calls him, Joseph, here am I. If I'm ready, send me where you want me to go. What do I need to do? I just think it, it's, it's a, it shows him, I think it just shows the amount of respect that he had for his father. I don't know if anybody has anything else they'd like to add to that section. Let's read uh, 18 through 20, please. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And he and we shall see what will become of his dreams. So go ahead. I didn't know if you wanted me to keep going. Oh, uh, we'll go through. We'll, we'll do this section right quick and then do 21 through 24 next. Uh, I've kind of followed the breakdowns of some of the notes that uh, were provided. So. Sometimes I combine them, sometimes I don't. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to talk about here is you just see how and his word here is debased. And all of this is a result of the polygamy that Jacob practiced in and the favoritism that he showed. I mean, they are to the point here that rather than suffering him for a couple days or some amount of time and sending him home, it just makes more sense in their minds at this point to kill somebody. Uh, considering they just slaughtered an entire town, what's one more person? Uh, it's really nothing. I do think it's interesting they say some evil beast has devoured him. That's a pretty accurate statement for what they're talking about doing to the guy. I mean, it's if we some, they know exactly what evil beast actually slaughtered him. So their, their phrasing there is pretty interesting. Uh, so you obviously the word that how they refer to him at this point, dreamer, it's not a term of endearment. They obviously are very sarcastic is the right word, but you can just see the, the frustration and the hate that they have at this point. They can't, they don't really even have a nice way to refer to him. And just how little life means to them at this point. It's just, it's pretty impressive. Uh, you do know that odds are based off the arguments that Leah and Rachel had, they had to be familiar with that situation. You can't imagine they weren't. The negotiations that took place on arguments, it, it just couldn't be a real pretty sight to be in there. So, I mean, the other interesting part is it doesn't look like it was much of a conversation. Here he comes, let's kill him. I mean, it's just that fast for him to come up with that as a being a, an alternative, an option, and the best option they have at the time. I mean, he was there to get a report. He would have been there for a very short amount of time, relatively speaking to their travel time, and then head home, and they wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. But it just, it's interesting, it made more sense for him to kill him. And not only did they come up with a plan to kill him, but how to cover it up, how to present it to Jacob at the end of the day. Uh, which is interesting trying to hide something from somebody who God talks to. I'm not sure how they were playing on that one, but it shows the short-sightedness of their decision-making also. But anything they want to add to, before we get to 21 through 24? They say, what will become of his dreams? I mean, those dreams were, they're from God. It's God's plan playing out. I mean, I know they don't realize it, so they're kind of unknowingly rebelling God's plan. Man trying to enforce something or you know, fight against something that God's already said is going to happen. So, and we saw the same thing with uh, Isaac and Rebecca. 
she knew that Jacob was supposed to take over, so she tried to enforce God's plan. We saw the same thing with Abraham and Sarah. Supposed to have a son, they try to enforce God's plan. It's like God, it's going to work the way God wants it to. Right, and the way that we see it lay out afterwards, they're they're setting him in a position to for them. Right, right where he needs to be, right where he needs to be there. They thought it was a brilliant move. Is what we're going to get into here in a minute. Right. So. Kind of like what you said, it's just so extreme to to want to kill. Right. I mean. It's like that's their first thought. Because, you know, you can get mad at your brother or sister. But to think, you know, I mean. For your first thought to go there. Yeah, I mean. Any thought at all, but the first thought. You know, I mean, it's it's like it's their first thought. You know, they don't have any. You You can kind of understand. (laughs) uh, Look at David. If his sons went that direction, he was a man of war. He was someone who was a conqueror of other plans to make the, the country of Israel. I could see having something of that logic that that was your problem solving method because that's what you grew up in. It was a wartime scenario. But for individuals that have got no gain from killing, I mean, they've no conquering it. All their stuff came from hard work. They made the deal with Laban. They made the deal, and you know his crops increased. They, at some point, they had to tie up with Isaac. It's you know and get those those uh, that property that Isaac had. So he's got all this property, and none of it came from killing anybody. It all came from God's blessing and hard work. So for them to go straight to that mindset, is, it's incredible. And I guess whenever the lack of discipline from what you saw Jacob showing when they did that action, his concern was not that they slaughtered an entire town. It was, okay, everybody's going to rise up and kill me. So. Maybe my thought, though, is the brothers, once, uh, like, in episode of nine, they took slaves and other things after doing all of that. I don't know if that led in their It's a lot less work than... Maintaining the field, waiting for the time. That's it. It's just something just read about. It it did take some things. And that very point is going to come up when they go, what gain is it to kill him? There's nothing, there's no long term benefit in it. So when we get to the sales pitch, that exact point comes up. That that gain, that personal gain. Unfortunately, it's temporary and pointless. Uh, Let's keep on trucking through 21 through 24. Really very early and he delivered me out of their out of their hand and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood but cast him into the pit which was in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, and he might he might that he might deliver them out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass and then Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped, stripped Joseph of his tunic and the tunic of the coat that was on him, that they put him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty there with no water in it. Thank you. So I think this is the first time we really see some common sense and some actual shift of peace to come into the play. Um, and oddly enough, there's even some deceit in it. Figure that one out. Uh, so this is where there's a comment made that he may have lost some of his standing because of the incident he had with one of his father's wives. Uh, but he still seems like being the oldest brother, he has some sway, some pull with them. Uh, I just can't imagine. I know Joseph brothers has to understand they don't like him at this point. But the way it reads, as soon as he showed up, as soon as he's in range, they just attacked him. Stripped his coat off and chunked him in a pit. Uh, based off the way it was written, I'm curious if they knew there was no water in it or they just happened to pick one that didn't have any water in it. I'm not sure what that, just the way it was written, I don't know how much that would have been any good if there had been water in the bottom, depending on how deep it was. But I didn't think that was kind of curious if that had been, the, if they got lucky or knew. I'm not sure they were too concerned with it either way. Anything you want to add to that? 
Can I come back to Reuben here in the next little read? The next couple verses, 25 through 28. Question. Yes, sir. 22. Six. Reuben's town, put him in the field to only a hand, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. That means Reuben was going to take him out of the pit, take him back home. Yes, so that's actually the next section we're going to get into is Reuben comes back around. And I'm trying to think of the next section of the section after, but he tries to come back around and pull him out so he can take him back home. But the cell piece that was going to the Ishmaelites had already occurred at that point. So his intent was, you know, satisfy their lust for blood at this point, for lack of a better way of saying it. Get him in a position where he can get him out and take him home and keep, it, keep him from being killed. Go ahead. I'm sorry? It's kind of stroke good. Yeah. One of them finally has one. That's the impressive part. Uh, 25 through 28 real quick. They sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, the company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother, our brother, and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So here's your game. We can sell him and make money, or we can kill him and not get anything out of it. But either way, we get rid of him. So let's get the money out of the deal. One note that was made here was Simeon may be the ringleader at this point, because as we get into the next section, we find out that Reuben was unaware of the sell happening. So the next one in line was Simeon. And if when we get into uh, Joseph being in position with Pharaoh, Simeon's the one that gets bound, thrown in prison while the rest of the brothers get to go back. So it seemed like he was aware of some of the decision making and who was making what decisions. Um, so not that he was necessarily vindictive because he could have had them all killed at that moment immediately and nobody would have ever thought, thought twice about it. But it does seem like Simeon has spent some time in prison for his decision making here. Uh, one note also is it kind of goes back and forth between the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. Um, oddly enough, both of these are cousins, I guess, of these brothers. Uh, Midian is actually the son of Abraham and Keturah, which established the Midianite line. And the Ishmaelites, of course, are Abraham's son with Hagar. So I doubt there's much love lost between the two groups. I mean, you got born, you got your mom, and all y'all got kicked out this way, and y'all got kicked out this way. So I'm sure that's not really hurting their feelings too much to buy one of their cousins. Um, but uh, one of the statements also in here is if you would, when you have time, go read eight Judges 8. Uh, I got 22 through 24, but that range in there. And it seems as if the Ishmaelites and the Midianites are kind of a, an interchangeable name at this time.